Continuing our study of dimension, I now want to look at some familiar concepts and relate them to the concept of dimension. Those familiar concepts are length, area, and volume. Also in this lecture, we're going to look at what I'm going to call scaling. What I mean by that is understanding what happens to these measurements of length and area and volume as we enlarge or shrink an object. So if we've determined the dimension of an object, then the next natural question to ask about it very often is, how big is it? Well, this question is ambiguous. What it means depends on the dimension. You can't really begin to ask this question properly until you know what the dimension of the object is. So depending on the number of dimensions, we may talk about length, we may talk about area, or we may, we may talk about volume. So let's first of all look at curves. When we're talking about curves, we talk about length. So we can imagine a curve as what you get by taking a straight piece of thread and then you bend it around into the shape you're interested in. So here I've shown some funny little shape that I got out of a, a piece of thread. And the length of the curve really intuitively or physically means the length of the straight piece that you started with before you bent it into this funny shape. For surfaces, the fundamental concept isn't length. You don't talk about a length of a surface. You talk about an area of a surface. And intuitively, it's the amount of paint that's needed. So here I have a donut. Remember, again, I just want to think about the surface of the donut, not the, not the dough inside, but just the surface. So it would be the amount of crust or the amount of paint for that donut. Now here I'm showing you some formulas for areas of various two-dimensional objects, some of which I hope are familiar and others of which I'm almost certain are not familiar. For example, for a square, if you know the side length and you call that s, then the area is s squared. In other words, to find the area of a square, you just square the, the length of the edge. And of course, everybody knows that the area of a circle is pi r squared. Now, when, again, when we say area of a circle, we really mean the area of the two-dimensional disk that it encloses. And that area is pi times the radius squared, where pi is a certain important number. For an equilateral triangle, if you measure the length of the edge, then you can find the area by the formula that's given there, involving the square root of 3 over 4. And there's a similar process. If you measure the edge length of a regular pentagon, you can actually compute the area. Now, you've probably never seen that formula before. And you probably look at it and start to freak out at the funny number that's there. But I don't care about that number. What I'd like you to do instead is to look at these formulas for area and to ask yourself, what do they all have in common? And that has nothing to do with the number pi or the number squared of 3 over 4 or this other crazy number that you see in the last row. The obvious common feature is that they all have an exponent of 2. That is to say, in the calculation of area, you have to square some length. The formulas for areas of all of these things are expressed naturally using an exponent of 2, that is to say squaring some standard measurement of length on the figure, either the length of an edge or in the case of a circle, the radius. Okay, And that number 2 is the dimension. You see the formula has an exponent which reflects the dimension of the object. Let's go over to volume. Now this is the basic concept not for curves or surfaces but for three-dimensional objects, for solids. And here are several solids. And for each one I'm showing you a formula for the volume. Those formulas look a little fuzzy on the slides and I'm not sure why but I think you can still see the important feature. For a cube the volume is s cubed which means s to the third power, s times s times s. For a sphere, if you know the radius, you can compute the volume. It's 4 thirds pi r cubed. And for a regular tetrahedron, as I suppose you probably don't know or care to know, if you know the length of the edge, then the volume is square root of 2 over 12 times that edge length cubed. Again, let's forget about the funny looking numbers. 
Again, what's the common feature? The common feature is that every one of these tell you to cube your length measurement. And why cube? Well, because it's three-dimensional, right? So again, the exponent is reflecting the fact that we're working with things that are three-dimensional. Now let's go over to scaling factors. So remember that two objects are said to be similar if you can obtain one from the other by any sort of rigid motion, so moving it around without changing the size or the shape, and also by scaling it. So that means either enlarging it or shrinking it in a uniform way. You can imagine this as a process of either zooming in or zooming out on the object. So I've drawn here very carefully on a grid two shapes which are similar. And I mean similar in the mathematical sense. That is to say I could obtain the shape at the bottom from the shape at the top by rotating it moving it downward a bit and then enlarging it. And the thing I really want to concentrate on is the fact that I've enlarged it. In fact, whenever you do an enlarging like that, there is some uniform scaling factor that's being applied to all the measurements. So the shape up above has various edge lengths. The shape below has edge lengths which are obtained from those earlier edge lengths by multiplying always by the same factor. Now in this example, I've just purposely created a rather odd scaling factor. You see, in addition to the rigid motion, the rotation has been by 45 degrees, so that edges which were running along the horizontals and the verticals of the grid are now running along diagonals, and something that originally was diagonal, there's just one of those in the, in the figure at the top, has now, is now running along the horizontal. Okay, so let's just concentrate on one of those edges. So there's one at the top where, as you can see, it runs along two squares of the grid. So m measuring using that edge length in the grid, this edge has length 2. Well, the corresponding edge down below goes through two diagonals. That means it's longer, right? A diagonal of a square is longer than an edge. And in fact, the length of that is 2 times the square root of 2, or 2.8. Again, the scaling factor is the square root of 2. Now we're going to use the letter k to stand for that scaling factor. In this example, k is the square root of 2. Just to give another example, what we're doing here is not just being applied to that length of edge at the very top. It's being applied to any kind of measurement or, dis of, or distance. Uh, let me say that again. Measurement of length or distance in the upper figure. So I've given you one example. Look at the points marked A and B in the top figure and the corresponding points also labeled A and B in the bottom figure. Now the enlarging of the figure has stretched out the distance between A and B. By using the Pythagorean formula you can compute that in the upper shape the distance is the square root of 73 which is 8.54 approximately. Again, using the Pythagorean formula, you can find that the distance between the points in the lower shape is the square root of 100 and, ha, 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 146, I should have said. There's actually a mistake there. Where it says 143, it should say 146, which is about 12.08. Now, how are those two measurements related to each other? Well, in fact, the 12.08 is obtained from the 8.54 by multiplying by the square root of 2, which is a, somewhere near 1.4. Okay, so all measurements of distance or length are multiplied by the same scaling factor as we move from the upper shape to the lower shape. However, the scaling factor applies only to lengths or distances. If you ask a question involving areas, then instead of using the scaling factor of k, you now you need to use the scaling factor k squared. In this example, if you square my k, which was square root of 2, you'll get exactly 2 right on the nose. What that's telling you is that in going from the upper shape to the lower shape, areas are getting multiplied by a factor of 2. Not by square root of 2, but by 2. 
the area of the entire figure up above and the area of the entire figure down below are not the same. The area down below is in fact exactly twice the area of the shape atop. Similar considerations apply if you look at volumes. Now here I'm showing you an example with um, a cube. Suppose you have a cube, like a sugar cube or a die that you would use to, to play a game, but a perfect cube. And in fact, suppose you have eight of them. Well, take those eight and you can assemble them as I've shown you right here. There's a couple that are, there's at least one that's hidden in the back. But as you can see, you assemble eight of these together and you get a cube that's bigger bigger by a factor of two. That is to say, all the lengths are twice as big as they were originally. The big cube has lengths which are twice as big as the lengths in the smaller one. But notice you've had to put together eight cubes. Well, why is that? Well, because the volume scaling factor is not two, but it's two cubed, which is eight. So if you're doing measurements of length, they will be multiplied by 2, but if you're doing measurements of volume, they will be multiplied by 8. In fact, let me mention one other thing. In the original cube, there was a face, and after enlargement, you get this bigger face, and it's four times as big as the original face. Why four? Well, because now you're talking about something which is two-dimensional, a face, and its area gets multiplied by 4.